This video will describe a specific test where we look at the student's T distribution. How many of you like beer? There's a great story in the field of statistics by a person that really invented this whole statistical test and really an entirely new distribution. This was a story of William Gossett. He worked for the Guinness Brewing Company in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he was a brewer, a farmer, and a statistician. He did basically all of the work behind what we're going to learn about here with the statistical tests, or the student's T distribution, but he didn't take all the credit for it. And so as an employee of Guinness, Guinness did not want him and any of their employees publishing under their name because he, the Guinness company didn't want others to understand what kinds of new analytical techniques they were using for some of the hops that they were growing as a part of their experiments to make better beer. And so the story of William Gossett was that he came up with all of the concepts behind this excellent distribution known as the student's T distribution, and he published it under the name student. He didn't even publish it under his real name for fear that other companies would steal Guinness's ideas. So I encourage you, many of you to look into that, Google some of the history behind this if you're interested in learning more. So we're going to calculate a value T. If we don't know what the sigma is, that is, if we don't know what the standard deviation is, it's unknown, we can calculate a T statistic. And so in this, we take the mean Y bar minus some value mu sub zero. This value mu sub zero can be anything we want it to be. Uh, oftentimes we set it to zero, but sometimes we'll want to test against some value of interest. Say a person that's six feet tall, or, or a group of students less than or greater than six feet tall. We can think about t as a random variable and call it a t score or a t statistic. And so this t statistic follows what we call the student's t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. We'll need to know that, especially when we go to look up a t table into the future. What are some of the properties of this distribution? Well, it's continuous. That is, it can take an infinite number of values. It's used primarily to describe a t-score. It has a mean of zero with a symmetric distribution. Many of you might remember the z-distribution we learned a few weeks ago. The t is similar to the z-distribution. It's actually very similar to a z or a normal distribution, but it's less peaked and it has wider tails. So in other words, the t-distributions have more probability in the tails and less in the center compared to a normal distribution. We can use this to reflect uncertainty uh, when we talk about doing statistical tests. What's the difference from the z-score or that z-distribution we talked about? We'll use the t-distribution when we don't know the population standard deviation sigma. Now a little bit more about degrees of freedom. This represents the minimum number of independent values that can specify some position of the system completely. Now all that means is that it varies depending on the number of samples. And so as the number of degrees of freedom increases, the t distribution more resembles that of a standard normal distribution. And so what you see here in blue is the standard normal distribution. As we increase and get larger values of t, you can see as we move from the black to the red to the green line, our t distribution becomes more similar to the normal distribution. So we can use the t distribution to look at different areas of the curve where interesting values start to happen. For example, uh, the, remember the mean of the t distribution is centered around zero. But as we move further into the tails of the distribution, we can have different values. For example, we can look up a value of 2.365. That would be the point where on the right, all values or the area of the curve represents 0.025 area of that curve, or about 2.5%. The same thing for the other side of the curve, where it represents about 2.5%. And so we can look and see with the t-distribution how these values align. 
And so what we did was we looked up a value T of alpha. Remember, alpha is our 0 0.05 with 7 degrees of freedom. And so that's how we found out these values of 2.365 and negative 2.365. We can also calculate things like a confidence interval for some value mu if we don't know what sigma is. Now assume we sample a population with an approximate normal distribution. Here's how we can calculate the confidence limits. We have our mean value y bar, and because we're looking at an interval, we'll have two values less than and greater than, or we'll do plus and minus. Some value t that we look up with n minus 1 degrees of freedom and alpha divided by 2, because we're interested in a two sides, a lower bound and an upper bound. And then we multiply it by the standard error, or the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And so this interval is really exact when the population distribution is normal and about correct uh, when we have a large number of samples n. Now we're going to look at and do some calculations for this example with mercury in loons. As it turns out, mercury is a pretty highly mobile contaminant that can cycle through land, air, and water. Uh, and really, loons are very susceptible to high levels of mercury, and it gets into their eggs. And so there's some data. Uh, from in 1998, the Loon Preservation Committee measured 60 loon eggs from nests in New Hampshire. And they measured how much mercury is in those loon eggs. They calculated a mean y bar of 0.54 parts per million of mercury and a standard deviation of 0.399 parts per million of mercury. So we're going to walk through a couple of exercises where we calculate a 95% confidence interval around the mean mercury content of the loon eggs. And so we know the mean from the sample was 0.540. Let's calculate a confidence interval for that. And then the second part says that the elevated mercury content of loon eggs occurs when mercury content is greater than 0 0.5 parts per million. And now the loon eggs actually get reproductively impaired when mercury is greater than 1.0 parts per million. And so let's look at these values 0 0.5 and 1.0 and see where they fall within our confidence interval. And so we'll do some calculations with these data. 